Welcome everyone. I know that there are people still joining us, but we want to get started. We have a lot of exciting things to talk about today and we're so excited to bring this third plenary to you of our 2023 Policy Academy. Um, we wanted to start off today by, by um, acknowledging that this plenary is brought to you by the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare, um, which is supported by the Administration for Children and Families, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and the Children's Bureau. And we're very grateful to them for, for this opportunity today to talk to you all. Before we get started, we just wanted to cover a few, a few housekeeping details, some reminders. Camera and microphone functions are not enabled for this session due to the number of attendees. But if you look down at the bottom of your screen at your toolbar, you'll see a chat box. Please go ahead and introduce yourselves and use the chat box to interact with each other um, today. We'll also, we'll be monitoring the chat and posting resources and other things in there as we go along and as we're hearing from Dr. Waite. You'll also see the Q&A box and please, we, we encourage you to go ahead and leave your questions there in the Q&A box and at the end of the session, we'll have time for questions. Our staff will be monitoring those questions and although we have time set aside today, if we don't get to all of the questions today, we will make sure that we're following up and getting those those answered for you. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Serena Amin, who's our the child welfare specialist from the Children's Bureau and also the task lead for the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. And Serena is going to introduce our speaker today. So thank you, Serena. Thank you so much, Kim. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Policy Academy's last plenary presentation. As Kim mentioned, my name is Serena Amin, and I'm a Child Welfare Program Specialist with the Children's Bureau's Office on Child Abuse and Neglect, and I serve as the Federal Task Lead for the National Center in this year's Policy Academy. We're honored to have Dr. Douglas Waite present today. This presentation topic will describe the history of our understanding of the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure on neurodevelopment, trace the brain-based developmental and behavioral manifestations of prenatal alcohol-related brain injury across childhood and adolescence, and highlight similarities and differences between other neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism and ADHD. Dr. Waite is the Division Chief of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at Bronx Care Health System. Dr. Waite holds an appointment of Assistant Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital, and is a member of the Executive Committee of the AAP Council on Foster Care, Adoption, and Kinship Care. He has worked with AAP at the national and state levels on raising awareness of the neurodevelopmental effects on prenatal alcohol and substance exposure, and is a participant in two panels formed by the AAP, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Administration for the Children and Administration of Children and Families, to develop protocols for screening children in child welfare and the general pediatric population for fetal alcohol and drug exposure. Dr. Waite has special interest in fetal alcohol syndrome disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder and the effects of child abuse and neglect upon child development. We'll have an opportunity to respond to your questions at the end of the presentation and please submit them through the Q&A or over chat during the course of today's presentation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Waite and we're very excited to hear this presentation today. Thank you, Dr. Waite. Dr. Waite, you're still on mute. There we go. There we go. Got it. Now let me get back to my presentation. Hold on a sec. For some reason I'm not. There it is. Good. Got it. Okay, um, thank you for having me and thank you all for um, showing interest in um, learning more about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and the care of children and the child welfare system who have had exposure um, or live with families who struggle with substance use disorders. Um, I wanna go a little bit into how I came into understanding about FASDs 
while weaving this in with some of the literature and our beginnings of understanding of how exposure to alcohol before birth um, affects the developing brain. So um, why I call this a constellation of adversity is um, I want to describe some of the challenges that we see um, that I see as a developmental and general pediatrician among children who've been exposed to alcohol. And whenever you hear the word alcohol, I want you to think all other substances. And because really, if you have a child born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, a child born with positive urine toxicology to any other substance, you've got to think about possible exposure to alcohol. So as I go through this, I want you to think about the characteristics that I'm describing for the children and how those will undoubtedly ring bells for you for our kids that you've cared for in the past. And reframe this a little bit in terms of knowing that these kids were likely not diagnosed and how this understanding helps us begin to understand what's going on with them and how we can put supports in place to maximize their uh, chance of um, achieving independence. So I'll describe the history of our understanding of alcohol exposure on neurodevelopment before birth. I wanna talk about how those manifest across childhood and adolescence and what you see when kids come to your um, centers or when they're working with your workers and what the adoptive parents, the foster parents and the biological parents struggle with um, most commonly with behaviors at home. And then I wanna talk about a, a little bit about some of the similarities and differences with autism and ADHD. Um, I will talk about how there's a wide overlap, a lot of these symptoms, but I'm gonna focus mostly on screening for prenatal alcohol exposure since that is the key to getting a child a diagnosis of a possible FASD and getting them services. Um, lastly, I wanna talk about barriers to diagnosis and how this has shaped our hesitancy to make this diagnosis and how we can begin to change that. Um, I'm especially eager because I know those of you who work in child welfare at the policy level or even on the front lines um, are coming across these kids every day and have a real opportunity to um, get these kids services that otherwise go unnoticed. So I wanna scroll back to 1973 when Ken Jones and David Smith, uh, two uh, geneticists at the University of Washington Hospital, described a constellation of facial features and growth impairments in babies that, they, um, that were just born. And I put down that each of their mothers was an alcoholic because at that time they found these features on exam and a syndrome is something that doctors find on exam and often name after themselves. So Down syndrome, which we now know is trisomy 21, um, was named by Dr. Down because he found a bunch of findings on exam, named it after himself not knowing what caused it. And only later we found out that three chromosomes on chromosome 21 is what's causing Down syndrome. In this case, Jones and Smith uh, proposed that this was caused from alcohol exposure before birth. They gave manifestations on the face and in poor growth um, in height or weight or both, and also led to developmental challenges. And they called this fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, so I was musing before we started here that I wonder in many ways, if Dr. Jones had called this Jones syndrome, if we would be in the same position where 50 years from now, um, I am talking to people because even though they're coming across these kids every day, they don't know about this. And I'm not saying you specifically, I'm saying physicians, including pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, psychiatrists, Lots of people, the majority of people don't know about this. Um, and I think one of the barriers to this is the fetal alcohol in that initial diagnosis. I also wanna draw your attention to this, that this was really described among Native American children. And the child on the left is a Native American child. And the tendency when we think about drugs and alcohol is to think about this being a, 
po problem of poverty or low socioeconomic status. And I want to dispel that myth because alcohol use disorder is non-discriminatory. And um, this affects all areas of the socioeconomic strata. And it was easy for people to dismiss the crack cocaine epidemic as a blight of the ghetto. But now that we talk about opioid use disorder, and this is pervasive across the United States and has hit white America, I think we have much more willingness to begin to look at things like fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and substance use disorders with a little less stigma. And I hope that that's the gateway that we can begin breaking down these barriers to see this as what it truly is, a neurodevelopmental disorder, which I will discuss in a second. So as we go through discussing how common FASDs are, I want you to think about, is there any other disability, any other disability that's as common as FASDs that would go so unrecognized by not only the general population, but by professionals 50 years from after it was described? And think about how quickly COVID took off. Think about Zika virus. You know, think about monkeypox, <laughs> all right? And nothing like what we're gonna be in a, dipping into. So we now know that the kids that are described as having fetal alcohol syndrome are the tip of the iceberg. Those are kids that you can see physical signs on exam. And I got into this because I was working in a residential treatment center and opened some foster care clinics in the Bronx and Manhattan. <clears throat> and we're seeing a lot, of, was a lot of children with developmental challenges that I couldn't understand. I knew a lot of DSM diagnoses. I knew a lot of developmental issues. And, but I couldn't understand because these were kids that were raised in an apparently good foster home, adoptive home, even adopted early on, no histories of trauma, why this was like they were on this malignant trajectory of developmental behavioral challenges. And I remembered the slide that someone put up in medical school for about five seconds, literally five seconds, where they put a picture of a child with FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, like I just showed you. And I began looking into this and I realized that this is what was going on. So FAS, when I find stuff on exam, that's the tip of the iceberg. The majority of kids do not have facial features, do not have the growth impairments that we see in fetal alcohol syndrome. <clears throat> so we're relying on other things like getting a prenatal history that we'll talk about. We now know that fetal alcohol syndrome is about one in a thousand children. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, it's a wider sweep of kids with neurodevelopmental challenges because of prenatal alcohol exposure are as high as two to 5% in the general population. As we go through, you're gonna see this pales in comparison to the number of children in foster care, because as you know, one of the primary reasons for kids entering foster care is because of parental substance and alcohol use, often under the aegis of neglect, but the most common cause of neglect, of course, is substance use disorders. So two to 5% in the general population, that means almost one in 20 kids. And this was done in a regular education classroom across five different sites in the Midwest, uh, first graders. So this is really, really common. And like I said, not being diagnosed. Now mirroring this two to 5% have been studies that look at alcohol consumption among women of childbearing age. And these were done by the CDC um, this was just recently came out that showed that 13% of pregnant women that were pregnant um, reported drinking alcohol in the past 30 days. Um, more alarmingly, 5.2% reported binge drinking, and a binge drink uh, for women on CDC criteria is four drinks at a sitting. So you begin to look at that 5% binge drinking, and it correlates quite well with the one in 20 kids we just discussed that have an FASD. So there's pretty solid evidence that this is really, really common in the general population. We know that having uh, mental distress, depression, uh, living in domestic violence, all of those things increase your risk of drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and as we will point out, there's a period of time before many women know they're pregnant that's the highest risk. So 
We now know this is the most common cause of disability. It's preventable by not drinking alcohol during pregnancy. Um, I've come to the conclusion that we're never going to be able to prevent alcohol use during pregnancy, despite education, because of this disease, alcohol use disorder, alcoholism. And um, having said that, I think that the education that you're getting today can help lead to prevention in future pregnancies, but most importantly, it can help us identify the children that need services. And you can see that FAS is in the middle here, fetal alcohol syndrome, autism spectrum disorder, 1.4% in the general population. FASD far surmounts the number of kids with autism, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome and cerebral palsy combined. So you begin to get an idea. Most people in the general population know about autism. They've known someone with Down syndrome. They have heard about cerebral palsy but they've never heard about FASDs. Um, and these include your workers that are working under you most likely. And you see the big bar here with ADHD, which we know is extremely prevalent, <clears throat> but I would add the caveat that most of those kids, if not all of them, were never screened for prenatal alcohol exposure. And as we go through, you're gonna see that one of the primary ways the kids with FASD present is with early behavioral features of inattention, hyperactivity that are invariably diagnosed as ADHD as early as age three to five. Now, I mentioned that this is especially common in foster care. And in a University of Washington hospital study of the first 1400 children that they diagnosed with NFASD, 70% of those children were no longer living with their birth parent and they had an average of three out of home placements. So these are those kids that have bounced around to multiple homes because nobody knows how to take care of them. Um, they are extraordinarily challenging. They require extraordinary supports. And this is why they move around and around to different foster home placements. Um, at least 34% were physically abused. Sexual abuse is common as well. They commonly, as I mentioned, have been diagnosed with ADHD and 93% had other prenatal exposures, including tobacco or other drugs. Um, one third had no documented prenatal care. So people who don't have prenatal care, people who use drugs and who smoke during pregnancy, high risk for prenatal alcohol exposure. Being in foster care in itself is an extremely high risk for an FASD. And yet in a clinic in Chicago, um, Ira Chasmoff and his group um, have a clinic there and they do FASD evaluations. 80% of the children who were referred from foster care for evaluations to them who were subsequently diagnosed with an FASD had never been diagnosed with an FASD. So if you think of the sweep of things as we go through the neurodevelopmental challenges that kids with FASD have, just calling this child ADHD does not do justice to the severity of the impairments that the child has. Um, typically they get mental health diagnoses, but they don't get the learning communication disorders. We'll talk about that more. And many times they have a kind of intellectual disability that doesn't show on tests that the school does. So we have to do other testing to bring this out, the challenges that the children have. Um, so these kind of challenges are not recognized because FASD is not being recognized. So really, really common in foster care, not being diagnosed. Stop for a minute and think about the number of kids who've come across your desk with a diagnosis of an FASD. If you've had those kids, God bless your region because this in general is not being diagnosed. But there are people out there who are making these diagnoses. So if we talk about, um, in addition to the issues of prenatal substance and alcohol exposure, we can also talk about child and abuse and neglect. And we know that this is a large number of children um, that come into foster care, neglect being the most common reason for entering foster care, neglect often being associated with um, maternal, paternal, uh, psychiatric illness, comorbid with substance use, or just substance use and alcohol use. Um, the physical and sexual abuse make this even more 
of a developmental challenge. We've come to describe something called um, developmental trauma disorder, knowing that trauma itself changes brain architecture um, and affects brain development. So you can begin to see as we go through here how these can be additive to the challenges that happen from prenatal substance and alcohol exposure. And if you think about the number of kids that are referred, the one huge group is before age one. And those are commonly kids who are referred for substance use exposure. Um, they get a positive urine toxicology in the newborn nursery and child protection is called. There is um, neglect called in and infants are found to, um, you know, the parent is found to have a substance use uh, uh, challenge. Um, so this area, these kids coming in, including those kids that we described with neonatal abstinence syndrome are really at high risk. Um, now, just to kind of clarify the comorbidity of substance use and, and risk in alcohol, prenatal alcohol exposure, um, you can see the number of kids that um, have lived with a parent with substance use disorder or have used substances. And we know that those kids um, that are below age 12 are at highest risk for living with a parent with substance use disorder. Um, there are wide variations across states, not only in substance use um, disorders, but also alcohol use. And therefore, there's probably variation across states in FASD prevalence. Um, but every state has kids with FASD. Um, overall, the incidence for alcohol use or binge drinking is greatest among those who use other substances with an odds ratio of uh, 2.9 to, to really 26 times higher. So if someone is using substances, you gotta check for alcohol. Notice depression's higher and it's higher for unmarried women. Now, before we begin to think about this as a low socioeconomic class, I want you to think about that not only is alcohol is not discriminatory, but women of college educated women are high drinkers during pregnancy, especially before they discover their pregnancy. Um, college is a drinking training ground. People go to college and they learn how to drink. And so this is not just lower class socioeconomic class um, persons and families. So here's a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. And I'm going to show you this picture and then I want you to forget it because most kids, one out of 10 kids do have the facial features, but most nine out of 10 do not have the facial features. But when people talk about fetal alcohol syndrome, they're talking about a specific facial features that include narrow eyes that, um, between A and B are called the palpebral fissures. So we talk about narrow palpebral fissures. It makes the eye look more round shaped. In addition, that point A points to a little crescent of skin on the inner part of the eye that we call the epicanthus. And having those little crescents on the, the side of the eye are common with fetal alcohol syndrome. You get what's called a smooth philtrum, the philtrum being the little ridge that's between our nose and our upper lip. And you can see in this boy that the lip is flattened and you get a thin lip. You can see the very thin lip there. So all of this, you can measure the palpebral fissures you can look at a lip filtrum guide and kind of gauge the severity of those findings. There are other parts of the face that are also changed. The, the mid face where you look between the eyes, they have what's called a sunken nasal bridge so that that part of the nose is sunken in and the nose is turned up and a little bit short. But this is the slide on the right is the facial features, but on the left is the brain. And I wanna to explain to you why the brain part that nine out of 10 kids, really 10 out of 10 kids that have an FASD um, have the developmental challenges that we're gonna talk about. We know that the corpus callosum, which is this little ridge hanging down in the middle of the brain in slide in the, the category B, that little thing hanging down from the roof that relays information across the two brain hemispheres is commonly smaller, or as you can see in slide D, even absent in brains of kids with an FASD. 
It doesn't mean we rush to do MRI scans on kids because not all kids have small corpus callosums. But what I'm highlighting here is midbrain defects, impairments in growth. And, and the corpus callosum is center in the brain. But what's also center in the brain is the frontal cortex, the front part of our brain that guides what we call executive function, beginning, being able to do um, carry out plans, being able to do day-to-day -day tasks. Also in the mid um, part of the brain is the midbrain, the fight or flight response center. All right, so all of these midbrain structures, we're gonna go through and how these present as the challenges for development. But the upper slide, the A and B remind us that the brain is the first thing to develop. And then the face folds around the brain. And because the brain has, if you have brain abnormalities in the middle, you're gonna have brain abnormalities, facial abnormalities in the face. So the brain forms, the face folds around it. And one of the reasons you can think about having these midline, middle face abnormalities is because all brain development is midline. Um, it starts with a little tube that folds into the part of the brain at the top of the slide on the left that's gonna form the brain. The other part that you see, the tail hanging down, this looks like a tadpole, um, is the spinal cord and the midbrain. And on the right are cells stained blue that have been killed by alcohol. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. So if someone asks me, is it okay to drink a little bit of alcohol during pregnancy? Um, I have to wonder, well, is it okay to drink a little bit of lead during pregnancy? Lead is a neurotoxin. Alcohol is a neurotoxin. How much lead is safe to drink during pregnancy? Who would even consider that question? So most of the time when people drink during pregnancy, they either one, don't know they're pregnant, two, can't stop drinking, um, and, and they don't have support services, which is why we're giving this to try and give those mothers support services. Um, and three, um, they've never been told about FASDs. So um, this is showing the early development of a fertilized embryo that you, we talk about cell proliferation. This fertilized egg grows into multiple cells that begins to form the little tadpole structure we talked about. And we basically recreate evolution. We look like little fishies at the beginning. Then we start looking like birds and lizards. Then we start looking like monkeys, then like people. But you can see here that at the top line, the brain is the first thing to develop. Before the heart, before the kidneys, everything, the brain is developing. So if you find out that a woman, most women find out they're pregnant between six to eight weeks of pregnancy, all during that time, the brain is developing by cell proliferation, two cells becoming multiple cells, migration going to the part of the brain where they're gonna nestle in, cell differentiation, hooking up with other neurons to form the functions that they're gonna function. And then lastly, myelination, um, depositing the fatty sheath around the nerve that helps conduct nerve impulses quickly, all affected by alcohol. So when we begin to talk about this, this is a brain-based disorder with behavioral manifestations, sometimes referred to as a hidden disability because you don't necessarily see it. And again, I want you to forget about the face, all right? FASDs are not about the face anymore. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome helped us to learn the, what alcohol does to the developing brain. But right now, the most important thing is what happens after that exposure and how it impacts development. So I mentioned the frontal lobe being affected. This is impulse judgment, um, impulse control. Um, it controls executive functioning. The little guy at the front of your brain that tells you what to do next, how to do it, basically get through the day. The hypothalamus that has emotional regulation, pain sensation. A lot of kids don't have sensation to pain. Um, they might eat very little or they might eat voraciously. Emotional dysregulation in the amygdala, we'll talk about that again as we talk about the effects of trauma. Coordination and movement in the cerebellum. Um, spatial memory, ability to do math problems is in the cerebellum. Um, memory and learning, so commonly kids um, have difficulties with they learn it and they forget it. Um, and then we talked about the corpus callosum um, 
communicating across the hemispheres. So this is what we call a static encephalopathy. It's brain damage you're born with that unfolds over the course of time. Unlike other brain damages that are progressive, this is static. You're born with it and that's the way you are. There's no cure for this. So what are we gonna do? There's no cure for cerebral palsy in a child who can't walk, but what are we gonna do with that child? Well, we're gonna give them supports, all right? So when we talk about development, we talk about streams of development, and we know that development proceeds in a timely sequential manner that for the most part, we can talk about normal development. And there's different domains that go from gross fine motor, speech, language, and communication, um, cognitive ability, being able to learn, adaptive function we'll talk more about, but that's the ability to do day-to-day age-appropriate tasks, and socio-emotional functioning. So when we talk about developmental disorders that kids are born with that unfold over the process of development um, and make themselves apparent over the process of development, we talk about the neurodevelopmental disorders. So you'll see in the DSM-5, one whole category of that a chapter is two, the neurodevelopmental disorders. And these are a list of the neurodevelopmental disorders. <clears throat> And as much as we like to pretend that they're separate entities, we're talking about something as complex as the brain. So there's a lot of overlap among the neurodevelopmental disorders. For example, many kids with autism have intellectual disability. Many kids with global developmental delay will move on into intellectual disability. Many kids with speech language disorders will have reading disorders or might have other learning disorders. Many kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders present with ADHD. They present with early symptoms of autism sometimes and they're diagnosed with autism. They almost invariably start with speech language impairment. All right. And some of them have intellectual disability, although it's much more common to have borderline or low average cognitive ability. All right. So I want you to be aware of how this fits into this it's really a soup because we're really talking about something as complex as neuron to neuron communication and as interwoven as the brain. But we're talking about these terms for one reason, to get a diagnosis. And we use the diagnosis to get interventions. Now, this is kind of charting out a normal developmental trajectory. So when I take a developmental history, I like to find out what kind of baby this was. Was this a calm Buddha baby? Or was this a baby who screamed and had colic and had difficulty with being soothed. Um, so what's called colic is really not anything to do with the intestines. It's got to do with the temperament. It's an intense temperament, which is like I am, in case you didn't notice. And if you put me in a straitjacket, which is what babies are born into, a neurological straitjacket, I would go nuts. Babies who have colic are very intense babies, and it makes them wonderful from age one to three, but thereafter, they are very challenging because they're all over the place. So difficult to console in childhood, difficulties with sleep. Kids with autism wake up at three in the morning for the day. It's classic stuff in the neurodevelopmental disorders. Kids with FASD also have difficulties with sleep, all right? Then we look towards social interaction. At age three to four months, when you're feeding the baby, they should be looking at you in the eyes. This is the time where parents fall in love with their baby. It's a time where you go down and you go goo, 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 and the baby smiles back at you, where you're inevitably hooked and you're doomed, where you fall in love with that baby. That's the basis for all later development, for speech, language, social interactions. So that's crucial. Now, if you think of autism, most people know with autism, kids typically don't make eye contact. They don't often have reactive smile. So very early on, mothers often realize something's going on. Then we talk about motor uh, skills, walking by age one. Um, we move into speech language. So by one year, I like a kid to be able to speak one word other than mama dada. Mama dada doesn't count, but a word like leche, bottle, dog, right? To talk, use a word to say, I see a thing out there that's called a dog. I say that because you know that that's a dog and we can have a loop of communication. That's a complex process, all right? Lots of places to go wrong there. 
And then by age two, they should begin having parallel play, playing next to proximal to other kids, but not necessarily with other kids. They can string words into two word phrases. They can sit and play for five or 10 minutes. They're not running all over the place and can't sit with the toy. By age three, they can definitely have this symbolic play where they pretend that the thing is like a telephone or they take any object and they're able to pretend it's an airplane. They begin interacting with each, with each other. And that's not just running after another kid in the playground. That's you take this car. I'm going to take that, that car. Let's crash them. Oh, they're dead. Let's do it again. So it's this interactive play um, that we like to see that, again, is absent in many kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. They should be stringing three words at least into phrases. They should be able to do goal-directed behavior. They're not wandering around without a plan. All right, they're going to get something. They can hear what you're asking them to do and do something. They can follow a directive. And then they also begin having regulation of their emotions. So when we talk about the terrible twos, that's before kids begin to be able to regulate themselves. So they have tantrums. Well, kids with neurodevelopmental disorders don't outgrow the terrible twos. They have poor emotional behavioral dysregulation. And so again, one of the main ways they present is with behavioral challenges that often are looked at without all the other things we just talked about being looked at. So when we talk about the neurodevelopmental disorders, we talk about intense temperament, difficulty with sleep that we mentioned, absent eye contact, inconsistent or absent reactive smile, gross and fine motor delays, speech delay, loss of interest in other, or absence of interest in other kids, poor eye contact, they can't engage in sustained play, they're hyperactive, they have tantrums, they don't sleep, and then by age three, you're off to the races. They may or may not be able to play, but often they'll play my way or the highway, so if another kid wants to do something different or tries to look at their toy, they hit them, which is a very effective way of getting kids to stay away from you. Um, they're hyperactive. They often engage in aggressive behavior. So early aggressive behavior is one of the hallmarks of children with FASD, tantrums, difficulty with transitions, all of which we see with kids with autism as well. I know I'm going fast. I have a lot to cover. So when we begin looking at this beyond age three, neurodevelopmental disorders become more apparent as kids get older. They fall farther and farther off the normal curve that we just saw. So many things like autism aren't diagnosed until after age four. We're working really hard to get these kids diagnosed much earlier, 18 months, two months, two, to two years, because we know they'll do better. Same thing with FASDs, but many times these things don't really become apparent until a kid goes to pre-K and the teachers say, gee, he's a little slow in speech. He could use speech therapy. And even more important with FASDs is the, is the discrepancy between what a kid can say and what they're taking in. Taking in is receptive language, expressive language is putting out. So many kids can yak, 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 yak away, but when you ask them to do something, they say, huh? Or they learn really quickly to say, no, even before you're done asking it. Um, so when you ask parents, how many times do you have to ask them to do something? And they say, oh my God, it's like they're deaf. That's the point. Um, so that's receptive language or what's also called auditory processing. Now, if you take a kid who has difficulties processing and you put them in a classroom, uh, let's say a second or third grade classroom where the directives are verbal, they're not gonna do so well. They're gonna look like they're not paying attention, like they're not listening, right? If you put them in a situation where they have to begin having conversations with other kids, they're going to take in a minimal amount and they're not going to be able to form friendships. All right. So these are one of the areas that commonly isn't, this is one of the areas that's commonly not picked up is challenges with receptive language. All right. Difficulties with peer interactions. They have difficulties reading nonverbal cues, facial cues. 80% um, of our communication is nonverbal, which is why we're doing these um, Zoom calls because it's more effective at communication than just calling on the phone. I mentioned auditory processing. I mentioned emotional behavioral dysregulation. So these kids go up and down with their environment. They need a highly structured, calm setting to do well. And so this is where we can begin putting into environmental in, um, 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 
uh, interventions to help support development. Um, they had poor interpersonal boundaries. So um, we know that kids with sexual abuse will often have inappropriate boundaries. They might come into your space and it might feel inappropriate. Well, kids with FASDs have inappropriate boundaries. They come into your stuff, but they're like little teddy bears. They're cute. They often seem younger than their age. Um, so they get away from it. It's different from the kids with sexual abuse. Um, so that's a common thing. They'll say hello to strangers. They'll hug my medical students or residents that they're meeting for the first time. Um, often by age three to four, I mentioned ADHD. They're all over the place, hanging from chandeliers. They can't sit in the seat at school. The teachers are calling the mom. They're not paying attention. When they're older, their backpack looks like a bomb went off. Um, they're impulsive. They often run into the street. Uh, I live in New York City, so that's the common thing I hear, that they really have to hold their hands. One kid almost jumped in front of a subway. They just don't have an awareness of danger. They'll throw themselves off of the sofa or from the top bunk and crack their head open. They might have broken bones because of that. Um, learning challenges. They commonly learn it and forget it. So retention, which is one of the things we see a lot in intellectual disability, is often a difficulty with kids with FASD, even though they don't have difficulties with learning, which is, which is what intellectual disability is. They might learn it one day, but forget how to do it the next. Um, difficulties with daily, daily living. So uh, this would look like a 12 year old. You know, this kid is like, like he's four years old. I shouldn't have to keep putting his clothes on for him. Well, that's the point. Look at this as not that he, she won't do it, but that she can't do it. Right, so that's the point that I want you to begin seeing this as a disability. <clears throat> um, confabulation, crazy, crazy lies. Um, a girl who says that in sixth grade, she was raped and she was shooting up heroin. She's with adoptive parents. None of this ever happened. They go home and they tell the, 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 their parents that the teacher was chasing Johnny around with the yardstick trying to hit him. So he ran out of the class. And the parent calls, what's going on there to the school? And the school's like, that teacher wasn't even in that class that day. So crazy, crazy stories. Early aggressive behavior I talked about, this leads to a high risk for school ex uh, suspension or expulsion as early as kindergarten. So many kids get kicked out of daycare, right? Kids have to repeat kindergarten, not because they're not smart, but because of their behavior, um, because they just can't settle into a class structure. These are the kids we're talking about. Sleep difficulties we discussed. All right, now let's go into the tender years of the adolescence where these things become much more challenging. And these are the kids I was seeing when I was working in residential treatment center because there's an increasing gap between their chronological age and their developmental age. I'm gonna show you a slide in a second that describes this better, but especially in adaptive function, tasks of daily living, keeping yourself safe, reading personal interactions, social interactions, difficulties with managing time and money, right? So they basically are functioning like an 18-year-old who is going on 10 years old, or a 10-year-old in an 18 body, if you want to look at it that way. Um, they have difficulties with receptive language, auditory processing, like I mentioned. So if you begin looking toward um, high school and then moving toward employment, if you're not taking in things and you try to fake it to look normal, you're not going to be able to do your job. Um, they have difficulties with engaging in conversation. So I'll ask a question. They'll hit the, the question back over the net, but they don't, it doesn't go back and forth. It's just a one way street. Um, they can respond to questions. Other times they can yak, 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 yak away about something, but it's not what we're talking about. So you might ask a question about like, what do you like about school? Oh, I like going to play, you know, basketball with my daddy. And we play, you know, so they're going off in a whole other tangent. Difficulties making, keeping friends, poor interpersonal boundaries. So really high risk for sexually inappropriate behavior without a history of sexual abuse. These days, a lot of kids have access to pornography, which has made this even more challenging. They have access to online chat rooms. So a lot of the kids I take care of are getting on chat rooms and trying to link up with adults. They act like they're older. Uh, girls are high risk for being trafficked. 
Um, that's a big thing I worry about with girls with an FASD. Boys are at high risk for peer coercion into criminal activity because they're gullible. They want to just be liked. They have difficulties making friends and they do stupid things. And then they often come up with the lies. I didn't do this. They I had kids who are stealing credit cards all the time that are like eight or 10 years old um, from their parents and they're buying things online. Um, it's taking money, taking things from the teacher in the classroom, other kids. Younger kids might come home with things from the school. Oh, Jimmy gave it to me. And they really just liked it and they took it. It's not something that's male um, malevolent, but it's impulse control, all right? And as we move forward, forward, you see high risk for school failure. If you're not going to school, you're hanging probably on the streets or with a bad crowd. You're high risk for getting um, in deviant peers, getting in gangs, getting linked up with the justice system. So think about our kids in foster care who transition to the juvenile justice kids system. Uh, duly involved or separately involved um, kids. So these are the kids that are really at high risk and difficulty again with transition. That's where we got to focus on with these edge kids. Um, they often have difficulties with their parents. If they've been adopted or in foster care, they go looking for their uh, biological parent. They run away from home. Um, they're punching holes in the wall, throwing things. They threaten their parents with knives. The parent has to lock their door because they're afraid their kid's gonna break in and kill them or something else. Um, emotional behavioral dysregulation becomes increasingly more challenging. The kids are getting more and more frustrating. They feel like they're screw ups. They don't know what's wrong with me. And increased risk for alcohol and substance use because this runs in families. This is showing the developmental trajectory that we see. You see the normal trajectory of kids with an FASD um, is much lower than kids that have um, uh, a normal development. And adaptive function, again, is the ability to do day-to-day -day, um, activities. I'm gonna hurry up so we have time for questions. Here's an 18-year-old kid I talked about. Speaks like he's 20, but comprehension taking in six years, that's a first grader. Emotional maturity, six years, that's a, a first grader. Money time concept, three years, that's a third grader. Social skills, seven years, that's a second grader. Take a third grader, say you just graduated high school, welcome to the world, we got you a job at the Getty Station, here's where you're going to live, we got you a subsidized apartment, you get paid at the end of the week, this goes for food, for rent, the rest you can play with. And you begin to see the challenges that we're talking about. So many of these kids have dependency. We know the toxic stress affects um, the brain, and as we begin looking at how this synergistically affects kids exposed to alcohol. Um, I talked about that slide already. We can see that the slope of emotional regulation is where kids really start getting off the curve in physiological tension, emotion, behavior regulation, and executive regulation very early on. And those are the challenges we have to build in environmental supports. Um, we talked about early uh, kids with early living with substance uh, parents who have substance use disorder and not getting the stimulation they need for their um, brain growth. Um, remember, this is use it or lose it. So if kids are living in a home that's violent, their brain is going to be programmed to live in a violent world. And they're snipping neurons that are more adaptive for the so-called normal world. So when you begin looking at this, the areas in yellow are areas affected of the brain that are affected by FA, by prenatal alcohol exposure. The red is expected by PTSD, and you can begin to see the overlap. So this becomes synergistic. One plus one equals three. So here you see prenatal alcohol exposure in the purple, and this is externalizing scores. So bad behavioral challenges, externalizing behaviors. And you see PAE, prenatal alcohol exposure, plus uh, trauma, and you see it's much higher, and the control is way down here. But you know these kids. This is our current treatment plan for kids with FASDs. It's really common among the juvenile justice system. Every kid entering foster care, every kid entering the juvenile justice system should be screened for prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, so lack of awareness, lack of how awareness of how this presents, lack of awareness of drinking during pregnancy, 
People don't know how to diagnose this. Professionals are uncomfortable talking about getting a history of prenatal exposure. There's no systemic screening that's done by from prenatally all the way up to pediatricians and psychiatrists and social workers and psychologists. Um, alcohol use is underreported by moms because of stigma and fear that their kids are gonna be taken away. Um, there's no biological marker for this. So it's a clinical diagnosis. Many of these kids are never di diagnosed because it's so-called a hidden disability. And other reason is that people don't know what to do if they make a diagnosis. So the heart of getting a diagnosis of an SASD is getting the history of prenatal alcohol exposure, knowing the subsequent things in neurodevelopmental challenges, and then knowing how to diagnose and get interventions, the next part. But let me talk about getting a history of prenatal alcohol exposure. So because many women don't know they're pregnant, um, you know, and are drinking prior to their pregnancy, um, the best way I have found to ask about screening for this is ask, when did you find out you're pregnant? Um, and this is a relatively easy thing to ask. Most women will tell me, oh, six weeks or like two weeks after my period. You know, a lot of times I'll just say six weeks and I'll have to clarify, does that mean six weeks after you missed your period or, you know, or six weeks total? Um, did you have any medical problems during your pregnancy? Were you prescribed any medications during your pregnancy? So right now we're on common territory that you might ask anyways. And then we throw this in, how much, before you knew you were pregnant, how much alcohol did you drink? Not, did you drink? How much alcohol, all right? And you know, you'll be surprised how often you'll say, oh, I, well, I had one yesterday. Oh, a lot. After you found out how much you, did you, alcohol did you drink after you found out you're pregnant? Oh, a lot. About how much was that? Oh, a whiskey bottle, <laughs> all right? And she was here for all the behavioral issues I just talked to you about. Um, the kid was all over, all over the exam room. What about other substances such as cannabis, cocaine, or other drugs? Keep in mind that drug screens at birth do not look for alcohol. The primary reason we're making a diagnosis intervention, this allows us to begin to have a language to talk with caregivers, including teachers and uh, other workers that are supporting the child about the challenges that the child is having and why that's all part of this brain-based disability. They, we can begin teaching adolescents about their blind spots. You know, just like we need to know you can't just jump to the right lane because there's a blind spot you have to check there over your shoulder. We need to teach them about areas that you have a difficult time reading other people. So you need to be really careful because you might not realize that people are trying to take advantage of you. Ideally, this leads to access to disability services. All right, last one I want to show you. This is called the um, Zygotsy prone zone of proximal development. The reason we're trying to get services is the middle circle is what a kid can do on their own. The outer circle is what they can do with help. So when we try and get intervention services in the school, that's where we're trying to work. The outer circle is what a kid can't do even if you give them help. Too many times we're asking a kid in one of these early or middle circles to do what they just can't do. That goes from learning math to reading comprehension to writing to just going to the store and getting some milk from you. What's the matter with you? Why did you give them all your money, right? Little things, difficulties with basic day-to-day -day stuff, which your mom used to call common sense that you learn just by being alive in the world does not always happen, all right? So this gives us a form for beginning to talk about these disabilities and the can't versus won't, which is typically where people are functioning. He won't do this, he won't do that, right? And we begin to focus on giving the families um, supports to support them in understanding the challenges that the child has. Realistic expectations guided by strengths. Start where the kid is. Start at that middle dark blue circle. Put supports in place before the child fails, not based on thresholds of need. This goes against the educational system that puts kids in the least restrictive environment. We want to get these kids before they fail. And too many times I see kids who've had their heads banged against the desk from kindergarten to fifth grade, and they feel like they can't do anything. And then they're called a behavioral problem and they want to put them under a classification of emotional disturbance or something. And then we need to coordinate these. So we are trying to bend the trajectory away from this toward this. 
They can do work. They can get to a place. They need help doing this, but they can function in society. It doesn't have to be fixing a bike. They can do computers. They, kids are really smart. A lot of these kids have IQs of 130, right? But they can't get through basic stuff. I, 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 I diagnosed a guy who was 31 years old um, and he just couldn't get through making friends in, in high school, even though he's going to an elite high school in Manhattan. So what do we have in common with wherever you are? I heard people talking about tornadoes before. Um, well, there was a cow that escaped in New York City, but the big thing we have in common is that alcohol is all over the place. Many women drink before they find out they're pregnant. We know many people drink during pregnancy, whether or not they know about FASDs. Most of the time it's because they can't stop. We also know that I could put a syringe there or other pills that people who use pills also drink. And the other thing is disability services. So in New York City, in New York State, any FASD except for FAS, I'm not able to get those kids disability services. We're working on changing that. It's different in different states. California just passed a law that they can get this now. So this is where we have to move. All right. And that is, this is my dream of what we can build. We can start with these. These are already in place. We just got to make sure everybody in these different silos knows what the heck an FASD is. All right. Um, so building a web in the community that we can rely on. And then you can never underestimate. You can never overestimate your day-to-day -day work with kids and families. We, you never can imagine how sometimes you can have one meeting with a family that can change things that you might never know about. But one of the things that keeps me working with kids that have these challenges is the hope that something I bring to that meeting might make a difference for families or kids. And I don't need to know about it, but I trust in this that something might happen. And that's enough for me. Um, but don't underestimate how important it is for you to be there with families. And this is one way we can work with families who are struggling tremendously um, with substance use disorders and whether they've adopted kids or they're their biological children and they're trying to maintain custody. All right, I'm sorry I went a little over what I was trying to do. I think that's fine. This is Nancy Young. I'm the project director at the National Center. And thank you so much again for sharing your, your information and your wisdom with us today. I know that from uh, the Q&A that there were a lot of foster and adoptive parents that could totally relate to what you were talking about. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of social workers that have, have experience uh, on their caseload. One of the uh, several questions have come in that we won't have time for today, but I want to remind the audience that we'll have some time with Dr. Waite at our January convening, and we'll make sure that all of the questions get to you so that we'll have those in advance. One, one question that seems important, how does a, a state... Uh, these are state policymakers, by and large, as, as well as a large county. Um, they're running these, these systems. How could they get started on understanding how to make, how to get the clarity in the systems of uh, what's needed to uh, diagnose, to understand, to recognize FASDs uh, among families in their caseloads? Well, I suspect that just going through the presentation, I rang bells on a lot of you that you've, these are kids you know well, you've cared for. And so you kind of know how this looks in life. The thing that's gonna keep the barrier to getting this diagnosis is gonna be screening for prenatal alcohol exposure. So I can't emphasize enough what I think is the most policy, important policy change at the state level is screening all children entering foster care for prenatal alcohol exposure, however you do it. Um, I gave you my way um, for doing that, but I think that this is one of the ways we can begin to um, start screening for prenatal alcohol exposure. While we're doing that also, we're letting people know that women we're interviewing and the 
parents we're interviewing that alcohol is something we care about, that this can cause a disability. That's why we're asking. I don't think I've ever had a parent ask me, why are you asking that when I ask it the way I just described to you? Um, and if they did, I would say, because I ask everybody this question, because we know kids that were exposed to alcohol, oftentimes before the mom knew she was pregnant, um, can have developmental challenges, right? So keep it very concrete. So I would recommend screening at the state level. Um, all kids entering foster care, all caseworkers should know about this. It's, it, you know, there's lots of uh, ways we can get education to your state if you want that. Um, but once we get screening down, that can be notated. The biggest challenge that I have is there's no history. You know, um, I saw a girl today from Russia where they adopted this girl at age five, but they went back to Russia and they found out the mom's dead from alcoholism, her the maternal grandmother and grandfather dead of alcoholism, right? Um, they kind of knew that before they got her, but if we need to know that information. And all too many times I'll see that we're born positive urine tox to cocaine or to opioids, but no one's asking about the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Oh, they came in for neglect. We don't know anything about alcohol. That's what I'm always hearing. So we need to begin to look at this. This is really important in foster care. It's as important as asking, do you have a place to live? Yeah. Thank you so much for that answer and very informative session that we've had today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll make sure the questions get to you. So we'll have time in January to address those questions and, and others that come in for, for those that go to the breakout with you uh, in January. Um, with that, let me close the session for today. Wish everyone a wonderful holiday season uh, and a terrific uh, new year. Thank you again, Dr. Waite. Thank you very much, Nancy.